Good morning, good afternoon, participants. This is module three that we will be uh, discussing about. It's more about risk, uncertainty, and vulnerability to poverty, the key lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is part one, and we will be looking at part two uh, in the next uh, presentation. So what we will be talking about in part one relates more to COVID-19 in Africa, giving you a snapshot of the situation in terms of cases, death, uh, measures, and also vaccination across African countries. Then we will be looking at the cascading and systemic COVID-19 risk and vulnerabilities, a conceptual model uh, which has been recently designed to look at the systemic nature of COVID-19 risk, What's the transmission from pandemic to poverty, vulnerability to poverty, multidimensional poverty, and COVID-19 and poverty? So this module is more about vulnerability to poverty. In the previous module, we've been talking a lot about risk and vulnerability, but today we will be focusing more on vulnerability to poverty and then link that with COVID-19 in terms of the systemic nature of COVID-19 and the different risks associated with the pandemic. So to, to look at the figures for Africa, just a snapshot. First, for the global COVID-19 cases, we all know it started around March 2020, where it was declared uh, a pandemic. And the, uh, since then, um, the number of cases started to rise across the world, in di across different continents, and many countries have been hit by the pandemic uh, with a number of uh, cases and also death. If we look at this chart, you will see that the global cumulative number of COVID-19 cases stood at 610 million as at 15 September 2022. And if we do a breakdown across continent regions, you will see that uh, Europe, for instance, had the highest number of cases, followed by Asia, North America, South America. Then we have Africa with 12.34 million cases and Oceania. Now, you will, there are a number of reasons which have been put forward to explain the low number of cases in Africa compared to other parts of the world. In fact, uh, they've been talking about Africa having a young population more resistant, Africa also uh, having a different setting compared to other countries. They have implemented a number of policies very quickly. They've been learning from each other rather quickly. So it's more a combination of measures which can actually explain the low uh, number of cases. Also, there has been uh, another argument where uh, it has been said that the number of, of reported cases, that is not all the cases, are reported. This is another argument which has been put forward. So when we use these arguments, then some of them are relevant to, to explain the low number of of COVID-19 cases compared to other regions of the world. When we probe further into the African continent and countries within the African region, we see that South Africa had the highest number of cases, followed by Morocco and Tunisia. South Africa, in fact, had around 4 million uh, cases of COVID-19 till September 2022. Another dimension which we look at, rather than focusing only on COVID-19 cases, we look at death via number of cases. And if you look at, at the data from our world in data, which we computed and generate graphs there to see the situation across African countries, you will see that Sudan, Somalia, and Egypt had the highest number of COVID-19 death in relation to the number of cases. In fact, Sudan lies around uh, 10% there of, of death, COVID-19 death in relation to the number of cases, whereas countries like Somalia and Egypt are on 5%. So the next indicator that we look was essentially focusing on COVID-19 death, and we wanted to relate that to GDP per capita. Uh, 
right? So we look at confirmed COVID-19 death per million people in relation to GDP per capita. And you will see countries like Namibia, Seychelles, and it's Swatini, top of the group of African countries in terms of confirmed COVID-19 death per million in relation to GDP per capita. So they had a number of of death there. This depend on this can be explained by a number of factors, in fact, in terms of the health system, the health situation of the population, whether they have comorbidities, etc. Uh, so in that case, uh, a number of factors depending on the measures which have been implemented in terms of mobility restrictions uh, which have been imposed by these countries. So the next dimension which we look at is, is in terms of vaccination, right? We all know that in addition to lockdowns, uh, to business closures or school closures, uh, also to travel restrictions, there has been an important focus on vac that COVID-19 vaccines. So when we look at the share of people who receive at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, across African countries, you will see that Seychelles topped the list with 80% of its population having at least one dose of the vaccine, followed by Mauritius, 78.7%, and Liberia, 67.5%. Countries at the bottom with the lowest vaccination rate are Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Madagascar, Senegal, and Mali, where the rate has been less or equal to 10%. In this case, you see that differences, uh, disparity across countries in terms of percentage of people who've been vaccinated. Now, we had a snapshot on the, on the situation of COVID-19 across African countries, but we want to look into the effects of the pandemic on these countries. We've seen that the COVID-19 has cascading effects across different countries. Not only the virus, but also the interventions of the governments and authorities which have followed to contain the virus. And these measures have, in fact, exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities because the countries are connected, systems are connected, communities are connected, so much that there has been increased consequences of the pandemic at the local level, and the impact has been much more on the vulnerable groups. We've talked about the vulnerable groups in module two. These are uh, people living in poverty, migrant workers, refugees, people with disabilities, women, elderly, young people, etc. They are more, they have been more severely affected by the pandemic. And we've also seen that for us to be able to look at this interconnectedness and the, in, the, the movement of the pandemic across communities, households, etc., there has been a new approach developed by the UNDRR and UNUEHS in 2022, which is called the Impact Web Approach, which looks at the spread of the virus as well as the health containment measures imposed by the authorities, the government, on the whole system, right? So they have been looking at how integrated the system is, and as a result of that, what has been the, the, the different risks, the systemic risks, and different effects encountered by, by countries, or by communities, or by households. So the different components of this approach looks at impacts, the direct and cascading effects of the pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, the direct effect will be in terms of the direct effect on health through the virus itself being uh, affected by the disease. The risk will be in terms of the possible impact of COVID-19 let's say, for example, on healthcare system, right? So to what extent uh, your, the prison healthcare system in your country can, can uh, hold, can uh, try to fit in the number of cases, the number of hospitalization, to what extent they can do that. Interventions, what have been the actions taken by the government, by the authorities 
to respond to COVID-19, like I mentioned, lockdown, border closures, school closures, travel restrictions, business closing down, etc. Now, given this intervention, given the risk that COVID-19 poses in terms of being a virus and disease affecting people, some were more affected. What are these drivers of vulnerability? Unemployed people, not being able to work, elderly women, etc. What are the root causes? What are the factors influencing these drivers of vulnerability? Then the other component are agents. What decision-making entities have influenced the risk and impact within the system? What have they done to reduce the impact of the COVID-19? Or what have they done to support vulnerable groups? What are the interlinkages with SDGs? We know that with COVID-19, many countries have been lagging behind and they are saying that their progress towards the, the sustainable development goals have been delayed due to the effects of COVID-19. Now, what are the sectors which have been most affected by COVID-19? And we all know tourism, transport, agriculture have been one, the ones being most affected. There are other sectors as well. The linkages, how do we link these sectors? How we, do we link the different components of society and how these linkages lead to feedback loops. That is how they, they, they affect other parts of the country or other countries. Then the other element of this model will be tipping point. That is how, for instance, is your health system sufficient enough? Is it of the required standard to face this critical situation of COVID-19, or is there a probability of it collapsing? So this is, the, this is the model which has been put forward to look at the systemic nature of COVID-19 risk. This is uh, explained in greater detail in the handout, uh, which is provided to you. So we, I have, let's say, included numbers there to capture different elements within uh, the model. For instance, we start at zero with the COVID-19 pandemic, having direct risk and impact on communities in terms of health impact, also on the hospital, on the, the health system in terms of affecting uh, healthcare staff, or where the hospital will need more equipment, more medication, um, let's say the latest technologies, etc. So the capacity of the health system is also impacted by the pandemic. So the direct risk and impact will be more in terms of health impact. Then we move to point two with pre-existing vulnerabilities of COVID-19 related at risk groups and health systems. So point one we've talked about, point two will be more those at risk, that is elderly, people with pre-existing conditions or comorbidities, people having a poor health or the health system itself lack equipment, medical supplies, trained staff or financial resources. Then we move to point three, whether this health system can contain the situation. This is the tipping point, yeah? Then we can move to point four because if you have an overburdened health system, they will, this health system will not be able to, to face this critical situation, right? The, they may be losing the healthcare staff. They may lack equipment. So this is the reinforcing loop point four there in your diagram. So it reinforces the vulnerability if you have an existing system which cannot cope with the present situation of COVID-19. Now, we move to point five because there may be, in addition to COVID-19, other hazards, natural hazards, climate change. For example, you may be having a flood or an earthquake, damaging hospitals, damaging uh, homes of people. So this is another shock which is there within the system. So this will be here in terms of other hazard, exposure to the virus as well as other hazards happening at the same time. 
But given this situation, of course, there will be interventions from government and the authorities. So point six relate to these interventions, which become important to reduce the spread of the virus, to mitigate the impact. But at the same time, we all know that with all these restrictions, those in the informal sector, they might be more affected, right? Because they can't work. There are mobility restrictions, stay at home orders, not all sectors can apply work from home. So in this case, high levels of poverty or informality will these pre-existing vulnerabilities will exacerbate, which is point seven on in the model. And this will have cascading effects on economies, on specific sectors like tourism, trade and commerce. And this, these are more likely to affect not only economically the system, but also socially, uh, people will be more vulnerable. And also the education system, people will not be able to sell, send their children to school. So in that case, these pre-existing vulnerabilities make things worse in a situation of COVID-19 and other shocks. So the interconnectedness of, of system, point nine there, leads to a number of effects and increased vulnerability. And if we look at the back to the conceptual framework, then you will see that nine point nine there look at interconnected cascading risks and impacts. And this can, can generate further global dependencies. That is, it can affect other countries. Because for instance, if, if we look at uh, these risks which which are happening, then they will be able to translate to other countries. For example, if you have a number of migrant workers in your country, they are not able to work, they can't send money back home, they can't send remittances. So their families in the other countries will also be impacted because then this will disrupt their livelihoods. So this is the global network risk point 11 in the conceptual model. Another example will be disruption in the global uh, supply chain, where people will not be having access to inputs, intermediate goods, which are needed to the production of their product commodities. So in that case, they will also be affected. So after explaining uh, this COVID-19 in terms of systemic risk and how it affects vulnerability, what we want to focus on today is vulnerability to poverty, which is the probability today of being in poverty or to fall into deeper poverty in the future. Now, it's often aligned to transient or stochastic poverty, where the vulnerability to falling into poverty arises when non poor households experience a shock and fall into poverty, transient poverty. Or it can be also that vulnerability of staying in poverty occurs when poor households cannot get out of poverty. This is chronic poverty. So to make things easier, we can see the diagram. Suppose in your country, you have your population being currently not poor and currently poor. So we, we tend to differentiate between the two. Those currently non-poor here, they may be never at risk of becoming poor right? They are okay, and they will not fall into poverty. So we will get rid of that. The other part, those who are currently not poor may be at risk of becoming poor at some stage. So they are vulnerable to poverty. Then those currently poor may be moving out and in of poverty, right? So they can be out of poverty at some point in time, but with a shock, they can become poor again. Then you have those who are chronically or structurally poor. So shocks make them their situation worse and will make it difficult for them to get out of poverty. So they will stay in poverty for a long period of time. So these three categories, I can include them into those people who are vulnerable to poverty. Now, there are different uh, contexts of vulnerability to poverty. We mentioned that earlier in module two, where we talk about low income, unemployment, uh, in, uh, unemployment or employment in informal sector, 
uh, lack of access to finance or credit for enterprises, lack of resources, uh, asset loss or economic loss. And we look at the socio-demographic in terms of gender, ethnicity, uh, cultural identity, age, and we also look at the impact of climate change. So these are the different contexts of vulnerability, but we tend to focus essentially on vulnerability to poverty. How can we protect these people? What policies should we put forward to reduce poverty, to reduce vulnerability to poverty of an individual or of a household over at each point in its life cycle. So how can we do that with the different measures? This will be dealt in module four and five, where we will be talking about policies, actions of authorities. This ECA looks at vulnerability to poverty in Africa. The economic report on Africa from the ECA looks at multidimensional poverty and monetary poverty across different African countries. And from their diagram, you will see that South Sudan, Niger, Burkina Faso has the highest rate of multidimensional poverty. So there is a di difference between multidimensional poverty and monetary poverty. Uh, because when we will be looking in depth into multidimensional poverty, it goes well beyond the definition of income in, in it includes other dimensions of poverty, like education, living standard, health, etc., which are very important when we look at poverty in across developing countries and more important for Africa in particular. ECA also looks at, in the economic report on Africa, looks at the proportion of poor people and people who are vulnerable in falling into extreme poverty by consumption group and within the African subregion in 2020. So in that case, you will see how poverty differs, how poverty differs across region and also across the consumption band there. And when we look at the distribution of people uh, falling into poverty, vulnerable and also to falling into poverty in Africa in 2020, we see that Nigeria has the highest number of, of people uh, in poverty, followed by Ethiopia, Tanzania, DRC, and Kenya. So how do we link COVID-19 with the incidence of poverty? We talk about illness, that is the health impact of the virus, but we also talk about measures, health containment measures put in place. So we have these two dimensions, which when we relate health, illness in terms of health, care costs and death of family members, then we relate that to consumption poverty and also multidimensional poverty. Then the other side will be in terms of these measures which the authorities had to implement to contain the virus. So contraction of economic activity leading to unemployment and economic income loss, increasing relative prices of food, fuel, again causing consumption poverty. So the other dimension will be school closures. We look at education. With COVID-19, schools have been closed. Children have not been able to go to school. So low level of education will, in the long term, lead to multidimensional poverty, and as well as inequality of lifetime opportunity. So ECA does that mo model to explain to us how COVID-19, together with the health and and measures put by the authorities may actually lead to multidimensional poverty through a number of channels there, a number of mechanisms that are all interrelated. We can look at the direct and indirect channels, yes. So another way of, of looking at that is looking at the direct impact, indirect impact, which I have already treated in the previous diagram. But also it will be good to see what are the policies that can be implemented to reduce or mitigate the impact, the direct and indirect impact of COVID-19. Now, we've seen that 
it goes the first channel goes through health the second path is for people's income whether it's loss of job or reduced income and the vulnerable people are the most affected whether they are in the informal sector or working uh, part-time or they do not have uh, a, a, an income uh, stable income and they are casual or seasonal workers and they do not have a number of, of assurance etc they are more vulnerable so what we want to show at the end of the day in that first part of the module is the medical model of disease risk, specifically in the case of COVID-19, is no longer relevant because the social and economic factors have amplified the exposure of individuals and households to the pandemic, increasing their vulnerability to poverty. So we need to factor in the systemic risk in terms of social economic impact on individual and of course the most vulnerable one are most likely to be impacted 